Tom Baker is a retired FBI special agent. He's written a book, The Fall of the FBI. And you should be able to get it on Amazon.com. I don't know about any other bookstore out there, but you can check him out for sure. Thomas Baker, welcome to the program. Tell us quickly a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, Mark, I, I spent over 33 years in the FBI, and then after retiring... I stayed closely engaged with the FBI uh, as a consultant and through several associations. Uh, I got to know, uh, work closely with several of the former directors, past directors, and uh, I was in the FBI and in FBI headquarters when you were chief of staff for Ed Meese. I got to know him slightly, not as well as you did, but he's he's a man I admire greatly. And uh, I worked with Louis Free and William H. Webster and their direct, oh, yeah. former directors I admire as well. Yes. And uh, uh, th- and I, I worked in a variety of assignments, as you see in the book, uh, in the United States and, uh, and abroad. I had the opportunity to serve abroad as a legal attache, and that was a very eye-opening experience. So you have very thorough and deep background. And you've written this book, and you take on James Comey, and you take on Mueller. Tell us about this. Well, I think the problem of today's FBI, and it's been a problem for the last four or five years, as you know, is a problem of culture. Uh, I don't think it's a matter of a few bad apples. Uh, You can start ticking off the names of all the bad apples you want. And I think the cultural change in the FBI began under Mueller, and then was uh, exacerbated by the poor leadership of uh, James Comey. Uh, and if I could just take a minute to tell you this, I, I think Absolutely. the key moment was, was Mueller became directed just days before the September 11th attacks. And in the, the, the September 11th attacks happened on a Tuesday, on a Saturday, the Saturday morning, he was after the attack, he was summoned to Camp David, uh, the presidential retreat in the mountains of Maryland, uh, to give a report, or that he believed he was there, to give a report on what the FBI had done. So between Tuesday and Saturday morning, it was actually only about three and a half days of work. But in that time, the FBI did what it does best, investigate. And in that time, they identified all 19 hijackers, their associations, their financing, their rental cars, their credit cards, uh, their connections, all the way back to Al-Qaeda. And he presented this report that morning to the president, George W. Bush, in front of all his top advisors in Camp David. And when he was done speaking, expecting praise and thanks, instead, George W. Bush turned and said to him, I don't care about that. I just want to know how you're going to prevent the next one. Shortly thereafter that morning, Tennant gave a presentation, George Tennant, then the director of the CIA, uh, with a plan of action going forward. When, and when he was done speaking, uh, George W. Bush said, great. And he turned and looked at Mueller. He said, that's what I want to hear. Mueller was humiliated. Now, we know this and we know the scenario because Mueller told us this several times, and other people who were there told us this. But then Mueller set up out to change, and he said this, to change the culture of the FBI. He wanted to turn away from its law enforcement mentality and become an intelligence agency. And a lot of bad things flowed from that decision. Mm -hmm. That's very, very interesting. Now... How was he at, he changed the culture of the FBI. How was he as an FBI director? Was he competent, political, partisan, a boob, what? Well, first of all, he was very hands-on. He was very demanding. He did not like, and this we all know now, and many, many other men will tell you this, he did not like the special agents in charge. He had been, as you probably know, Uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office and a U.S. Attorney uh, in two different cities, uh, San Francisco and Boston. Uh, He had dealt with the case agents there. He didn't like uh, the agents in charge. And some people say he didn't like any agents, but that's that's all a matter of opinion. Uh, 
but with with the September 11th attacks, he wanted that entire investigation handled out of headquarters by headquarters, not by any field officers. Now, this is very contrary to FBI procedures in the past where we had an office of origin. And in the September 11th attacks, it logically would have been New York or perhaps Washington Field. Uh, in both cases, they had international squads that had been working on Al Qaeda for several years already, and we and there were agents in the field who had a lot of experience in in, the, in this type of thing. But he wanted all pulled into headquarters right under his thumb, and he pushed back at anybody who told them differently. So that was the first case run out of headquarters. Later, Comey did the same thing with the Hillary Clinton email investigation and the Russian collusion investigation of, of the Trump campaign. That, that had a lot of immediate bad consequences, because when you do that, when you run it out of headquarters like that, the people making the top decisions in headquarters are the people doing the investigations. You've eliminated layers of review, typically, and I know you probably know this, uh, Mark, but typically you have a case agent. He has a, a field supervisor over him out in the field. Then there's the agent in charge of that field office. All levels of review, then headquarters has, at different levels has oversight of them. Mueller did, and then Comey did away with all of that for these sensitive investigations. They called them headquarters specials. So you had in the presidential investigation, the investigation of Trump, you had a person making decisions. Uh, for instance, Peter Strzok, a deputy assistant director, making the decision in the case, and then literally going out and doing the investigation, conducting the interviews. No review, no independent judgment. It was bound to end badly. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. The, what, what are the big differences between Mueller and Comey? Comey strikes me as extremely political and sort of a king who sits back and waits for people to tell. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. How, how do you see it? Okay, well, Mueller, uh, Mueller, as I said, was very hands-on, very demanding uh, of, of his subordinates, uh, very rigid, very demanding, but very well informed, very on top of things when he was on his game, very on top of things. Comey is described to me by executives who worked with him as someone who floated above it all. And I literally, one guy waved his hand over his head describing it. He didn't get involved in any of the details. He floated above it all. Uh, that was Comey's management style. Mm -hmm. Somebody has referred to that as lazy. Was he lazy? Uh that uh, one of my reviewers of my book used that, and that yes. might, might fit in because he was lazy. He, but he did set out. I mean, he was malicious too. Let's not. All right, I don't up. want you to leave, Thomas Baker. We want to carry over the bottom of the hour. Retired FBI special agent. You can tell enormous experience. I want to focus on Comey now. Fantastic book, The Fall of the FBI. Uh, it's on all my social platforms, the link that is, and you can go directly to Amazon.com if you'd like to order your copy. And I saw a review of the book. You might remember I mentioned it on the air a week or so ago, and I said, we need to have this gentleman on the program. And here he is. Thomas Baker, tell us about James Comey. The audience is going to be very curious about what you think. Well, if the synopsis of the bottom line on it is, I, it is my opinion that James, uh, James Comey is, was the worst director the FBI ever had, that he did more damage to the FBI and its reputation than the other director. Uh, and you, you used the term uh, lazy, or, or you quoted somebody else who did. Uh, that might fit the case because he, he was not hands-on. He was floating above it all. And he let a lot of things happen. Number one, the initiation of the investigation of a president of the United States based on little or no predicate information. That was the most disastrous thing and one of the most disastrous things that have ever happened to our country. Yeah. He allowed that to happen in his laziness. Then, they, uh, then there was a, a, a FISA warrant, which we could spend a lot of time just talking about FISA, initiated against an American citizen, Carter Page. 
he signed personally signed three of the four Pfizer applications or renewals. And uh, he obviously, unlike previous directors that I can talk about, like William Webster, he obviously didn't read that because if he read it, he would have seen right through it that there wasn't enough predicate in those warrants. And the inspector general has found that out or found that out quite early on. So he was lazy. He floated above it all. He did a lot of damage. He tried to incriminate a president. He, he did a memo of his initial conversation with uh, President Trump at the time and uh, then immediately leaked the memo trying to incriminate a president. What was he thinking? Do you think, and I knew a lot of great men and women who worked at the FBI at the senior levels. I met with them all the time. Do you think you and they would be welcome with open arms back into the current FBI? Uh, I'd like to think so, but I don't think so. I, I, I have continued to talk to FBI executives and uh, people who recently retired. Uh, at book signings around the country, I have found that very validating, I'll use that word, that people come up to me who were executives, in fact, in the time period you're talking about, uh, who have told me, uh, you know, encouraged me in what I'm doing. Um, so that, that is heartening. Um, I don't think so. I'll tell you why. And it's in the book. Uh, when Bill Barr became attorney general, which was, I think, six or eight, six months, maybe 18 months after uh, Ray uh, Christopher Ray had become FBI director. The, the problems were apparent to many of us and, and to him, certainly. And Bill Barr was in close contact with many former FBI executives. This is, I'm not telling a secret out of school. Right. They've discussed it. He's discussed it. Uh, and he proposed, and I have this in the book, and I have a couple of names in the book, not all the names, because some people prefer not to have their name used. But Bill Barr proposed early on to Ray that this was a cultural problem, not a few bad apples. And he made a specific proposal of a panel of advisors of three former FBI top executives uh, to, to advise him and guide him to get the FBI back on track as a law enforcement organization. Ray pushed back on that idea. Now, some people could sympathize with Ray and saying, well, he didn't want outside interference or whatever, but he pushed back on that idea. And so a number of these men, and I talk about this towards the end of the book when I get to the section, The Ugly, uh, did in fact informally advise uh, Bill Barr on a lot of things. And Bill Barr to this day, he spoke only about two weeks ago at a National Review Symposium, and he clearly enunciated, as I've been doing, that the problem with the FBI is the change in culture that Mueller and Comey threw the baby out with the bathwater when they were trying to introduce more intelligence into the FBI, and that that is the root of the problem, and the culture has to be addressed. There have to be structural changes, and that's Barr's current words, and that's certainly my thinking, and that's certainly the thesis in my book. But if... You're the Attorney General of the United States, and you can't get these things done, or at least <clears throat> get them in initiated in a way, because your FBI director is standing in the way, and I'm no fan of Christopher Ray in the least. If he can't do it, who the hell can do it? Well, that's the problem. I think down the road, hopefully a new administration, a new director, uh, a new Attorney General... The, the director can't do it himself. He has to have the whole management team. They have, they have to recognize the problem. And I've heard Ray numerous times, every time one of these problems comes up, uh, he, I call it the bad apple argument. He says, we've gotten rid of these people. The, the people who were involved in the, in the Russian collusion thing, they're no longer with us. Uh, when, they, when the investigation in Michigan about the conspiracy against the governor went off the track, he had two or three of those agents fired. Uh, when the investigation of the gymnast, which was handled awfully, uh, he had two, uh, two of those agents are gone. Uh, and, and every time something happens, he says, well, they're no longer with us. Uh, in this uh, latest thing, which is really scary, 
when you see these intelligence analysts who are very woke individuals and have gotten a lot more power in recent years in the FBI, when they were come up with a proposal uh, to to develop intelligence on traditionalist Catholics, ascribing to them all kinds of uh, evil intentions when there is no proof and there was no proof offered whatsoever and they've never advocated violence much less committed any violent acts uh, when that all came to light thanks to a whistleblower uh, ray mealy said well they don't represent fbi values well you got to look at why is all this happening again the culture has to be changed we have to get back to the constitution back to our roots in law enforcement Back to a law and order, swear to tell the truth, law enforcement mentality. There, there is such a difference between a law enforcement agency and an intelligence agency. Unfortunately, Ray, who had been an assistant attorney general for national security, and a lot of the intelligence analysts who've risen up in the Bureau in the last 20 years since September 11th, they don't see this. I've talked to some of them in person, and they give you back a lot of double talk about uh, extremists this versus terrorists that they don't see the need to get back to the fundamental grounding in the constitution that we used to have the respect for the constitution that was shared certainly by the special agents let me ask you this what about the uh, <clears throat> you've got a special counsel here and you have a warrant a SWAT team that goes down to Mar a Largo. I can tell you, uh, Thomas Baker, that if I had been chief of staff and I'd brought to Attorney General Meese the idea coming out of prosecutors of the FBI that we sent a SWAT team down to Georgia because Jimmy Carter had documents, we asked for him for a period of a couple of months, and we don't know if we have them, he would have thrown me the hell out of his office. He would have said, we don't use warrants and SWAT teams against former presidents of the United States. Just go down there and, and negotiate. Or he would have picked up the phone and called him and said, hey, look, this is the situation. So forth. we would never have gone through that route. Was it shocking to you as an old FBI guy? I don't mean age-wise. I mean experience-wise. Well, absolutely, Mark. And what you described absolutely is, is my recollection and my experience, too. Uh, in so many of these things, which are essentially white-collar crime, um, I mean, if someone was arrested, two guys in suits and ties went up to arrest them. But often in these white-collar crime cases, uh, you, you'd have the uh, the man's attorney would bring him in. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, th th there's an abuse. You know, first of all, let me say this. So many of these things that have happened, in, in addition to, to Ray falling back on that he fired all these bad people or let them leave, which is true. What, what they also fall back on in so many of these is it's legal that, for instance, the search warrant of Mar-a-Lago undoubtedly was legal. Undoubtedly, there was an affidavit sworn before a, a, a magistrate to get that search warrant. Und, undoubtedly, a lot of these things are legal, but just because they're legal doesn't make them right. To use authority to use power raw power like that when it's unnecessary is an abuse and that's what a lot of these things have been is an abuse of authority mm -hmm. an abuse of power an abuse of an office and you're christopher ray you obviously listen again when i was there if there was a big issue the fbi director directly the associate attorney general of the united states the deputy attorney general the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and the Attorney General, they all be sitting around a table and discussing this. It didn't just happen at the, uh, at the agent level or the special agent level. This is big deal. So they all had to sign off on it, Tom. Mark, you're exactly right. And, and that's one... Uh, uh, particular case I can mention, which uh, I think your your period, uh, your time overlaps some of this, was Abscam. I can oh, remember, yeah. and other cases that well, I was in the field office that we would have to take when the, the, the subject was potential subject, 
was a congressman or a U.S. senator or some official like that or a judge, we would have to go sit down before the director. This is before the director gets to sit in on the meetings you're talking about with the attorney general and the associate attorney general. We'd have to sit down with the director, come over from Washington Field, and you know what he kept asking? Do you have more? Do you have Mm -hmm. more? Is this all you have? Those are the questions we got. But these people, they went off and and initiated an investigation of a president of the United States based on a secondhand rumor. This fellow Papadopoulos speaking at a bar in London. They started that investigation. We'd we'd go over with a lot more stuff than that uh, about on a congressman, for instance. And and Judge Webster, the FBI director at the time, would send us back to get more. You don't have enough to go forward on this. The mentality today has because it's a loose mentality. It's an intelligence mentality and an intelligence agency operates to certain to looser standards. In a law enforcement agency, as you know, every day, that special agent at that level, and the same as a policeman or a police detective, they're working towards the day when they're going to have to stand up in a courtroom, raise their right hand, and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's a hell of a lot different than an intelligence Mm -hmm. agency where you can engage in speculation, as this intelligence analyst did, speculating that traditional Catholics who like to use Latin are somehow a threat to our democracy? Let me tell you something, Thomas Baker. You're terrific. The book is terrific. I want you to get it, folks. A lot of this will uh, make sense, what's been going over the last many years. The Fall of the FBI, excuse me, that's the name of the book, The Fall of the FBI. You can go to Amazon.com or any of my social sites. It was Glenn Beaton who did the review on Substack of your outstanding book, and Thomas Baker. Tom, if I may call you that, I want to have you back. I have to to go now, but uh, your insight is absolutely indispensable, and I want to make sure you have a national platform, or at least you can talk to me from time to time. Is that a deal? Mark, thank you, and thank you for all the good that you do. Thank you, sir. God bless. Wow, he was great, was he not, Mr. Producer? 